description. And Amy is going to talk about using inclusive and bias free language guidance from APA. Um, Amy is our assistant dean for teaching and learning and education librarian. So, Amy, you can take it away. All right. Thank you, Sam. It's great. OK, so um, to give you a little bit of historical background on this, I don't know um, how many of y'all are huge APA aficionados like I am. Um, but the seventh edition of APA came out in 2020, and in this is it. I always keep it close by; it's always within arm's reach. Um, within the seventh edition, they included a section on uh, reducing bias in language, which I thought was really great. Um, and then back in November, they released uh, an updated version of their um, guide to inclusive language. So that is kind of what inspired me to do this presentation. Um, I think that APA does a really nice job with this. They're not paying me, but if y'all know anybody at APA, um, let me know. Uh, because I just I think this is a, a, a good thing to talk about and, and be aware of. So that's why I wanted to do this uh, today. And based on the number of people who signed up and who actually showed up here today, I'm going to say that people find this like a, a, to be an interesting topic. So I'm glad y'all are all here. All right, there we go. OK, so we're going to talk about four different things. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the guiding principles behind the APA Inclusive Language Guide. We're going to talk about person first and identity first language, which may be new information to some people. Some people may already feel comfortable with that idea. Um, we're going to talk about asset versus deficit language and also destigmatizing and othering language. And then we're going to talk about ableist and violent terminology. So um, that's that's the plan for today. Um, if any of this makes you uncomfortable, please feel free to log out. Um, we're talking, we are talking about issues of identity and things like that. So if this is not, if you're not in a place today to um, listen to this, you will not hurt my feelings at all. Um, so just want to be aware of that. I also just want to kind of situate myself in this whole idea. Um, this presentation will talk about a lot of identity groups that I'm not a part of. Um, so I may get things wrong. APA may have gotten things wrong. Um, language grows and evolves as knowledge grows and evolves. And we hopefully are growing and evolving along with it. Um, the terminology that APA talks about as appropriate in writing may not feel that way to everyone in all of these groups. So I just want to say all of that in advance. And these are guidelines and guidance, but you know they're not absolutes. Um, and one thing that we'll talk more about in the guiding principles section is that the most important thing when you're referring to folks as part of a group is that you use the terminology that they would use, that they use for themselves. So, and also, I know Sam mentioned the Q&A. I have read these a lot. I feel like I have a lot of experience with them at this point. May not be able to answer all your questions, so apologies in advance for that. All right, so I did want to point these out. Um, these are the two resources that I used mostly for this presentation. The APA Guide to Bias Free Language. Um, that is the uh, website version of what is in the seventh edition of the publication manual. And then also this uh, APA Inclusive Language Guide, which is the one that I mentioned earlier that came out in November. All right, so the guiding principles. Basically, what I've already said, um, as identities evolve and, evolve and people learn more, language and terminology evolves along with it. Um, the first edition of the Inclusive Language Guide was published in 2021, and the second was published two years later because APA felt that things had already changed significantly enough that warranted a new edition. And <clears throat> I imagine that that is probably going to be true going forward. Um, some changes between the first edition and the second edition is that they talk about weight stigma and how to use neutral terms when talking about bodies. Um, and they also talk about gender inclusive pregnancy terminology. 
The other guiding principle, which is really true for all of the um, all of the bias free language aspects of APA is to acknowledge the humanity of people and show respect. So that's kind of the centering principle, I think, for all of these guidelines is just to to show respect for people and make sure that you're always acknowledging their humanity. So just for fun, because I'm kind of a nerd, um, I wanted to show you uh, a historical example from 1977. Okay, um, I it hurts me deeply to call something from 1977 historical, but um, oh well, it is, I guess. So this is from a document that was called Guidelines for Non-Sexist Language in APA Journals. It was a task force from the American Psychological Association. And some of their guidelines were things such as find out the sex of the person discussed and use the correct pronoun. Avoid using pronouns when sex is undetermined or he slash she or he or she. Of course, they have since in the seventh edition, of course, they talk about they use they as the correct pronoun if gender is unknown or unimportant to the sentence. Um, also, they talk about using humans, people instead of man or mankind. So it's one giant step for a uh, personhood, I guess. I don't know. Um, avoid use of irrelevant demographic information. And my favorite, favorite parallel construction. So we're not allowed to say men and girls anymore in 1977, which is truly sad. Also this, again, I just, I was talking to some friends yesterday in counseling and uh, we were enjoying, we were having a good laugh about the previous usage of uh, the client's husband lets her teach part-time and some ways that we might restate that um, to be less, less sexist again in 1977. I also personally really appreciated um, number 13 there, which is uh, research scientists neglecting their wives and children being changed into neglect their families. Um, so anyway, the, I just, I wanted to show you these things just to show you two things. One, that language has evolved and continues to do so. And also that, you know, this is something the APA has had their eye on since the 70s. And, um, you know, is something that they are aware of and are kind of following, you know, the social and societal changes that are happening in the world. So I don't know. I just think these are interesting examples. OK, so now we're going to jump into person first and identity first language. Um, still kind of new at presenting in teams. I wish I could see y'all, but that's okay. Um, so for some of you, again, this might be new information. For some of you, it might be something that you're already super comfortable with. So person first language is basically just the idea that when you are referring to members of a group or a member of a group, that you do it with a like person with or people with construction. So basically, you're, you're centering the person. So again, in a lot of cases, it would be a person with. Um, so one example, a person with ADHD, a person with intellectual disabilities, as opposed to the intellectually disabled or something like that. Um, they call those um, adjectives as nouns. So instead of saying the poor, which really doesn't have people in there, so it'd be um, a person of a lower socioeconomic status or something like that. So basically using this person with construction. Um, and in most cases, this is the preferred terminology. Um, in some cases, however, I did it. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. I forgot I had another slide. Um, it's also can be used to replace other negative labels. So this example here is AIDS victim, drug abuser, um, and those are, you know, both kind of things that don't, you know, AIDS victim. It doesn't sound like we're talking about a person, right? It's sort of an abstract concept. So, and also it's a, a negative connotation. So a person with AIDS would be a more human centering term. 
Um, Amy, you might be about to talk about this, but just to mention that this was in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, please discuss the male female words. This came up in a class and student objected to the speaker's use of this terminology. And I still don't understand this. Do you mean using like the term male and female or using men and females? I see that a lot um, for some reason. So it's so APA says that you are not supposed to use males and females it should be well if, if that's what you're saying i'm not exactly sure what you're asking but they consider like females to be a um i guess pejorative would be an appropriate word for that but um that if you are talking about men and women you use the term men and women female is an adjective um so you could say like the female cat or the you know the male rabbit but that you don't use male and female as nouns according to APA style. Is that is that the question? Is that am I addressing the right thing? Uh, on, yeah, they said I see. Thanks. Sure, and I can point you after this. I can point you to chapter and verse of the uh, APA handbook if that would be helpful. Um, okay, so in some cases, though, identity first language, which is the opposite of person first language, is preferable. Um, the two most notable terms or the two most notable groups that tend to prefer identity first language is um, autistic people and big D deaf people. And when I say big D deaf people, I don't know if that's confusing, but um, so people who use the capital D deaf uh, see it as like a, it's a culture. So they are a part of a culture, um, their livelihood, their personality, their humanity is in is inextricably connected to their deafness. Um, so they prefer to have deaf to be use the construction deaf people. Autistic people similarly. So people who um, with autism tend to prefer to the term autistic people to people with autism um, because it just kind of it's it says that you know this is a part of them that cannot be separated from their you know personness, I guess. Um, again, the most important thing here is if you know, if if you are interacting with someone or you're doing research and you're involving a community or group or something like that, always check with them on the tech, the terminology that they use or that they prefer and use that. So that supersedes everything. Um, you know, if you are, do you know, interviewing or doing something with a person with ADHD and they say, actually, I prefer to be called a neurodivergent person, call them a neurodivergent person. Um, so that's that's the most important thing, but these two kind of ideas just kind of give you a starting point to talk to think about how to identify people um, in speaking and writing. Some groups use reclaimed language, and for reasons that I hope are obvious, I will not be sharing any examples of this, but this is when a group reclaims um, language that was once seen as offensive to describe themselves and to destigmatize that language, um, that terminology should only be used by people who are members of that group. So, um, well, I can use, so one example, I think a more recent example is the idea of reclaiming the use of the word fat uh, to be used as kind of a neutral body descriptor, you know, people like fat people. And so that would be a term that people in that community would use, but it's not it's not a term that people outside of a community should use. Again, the most important thing is to ask people how to talk about their identities. Um, you can also consult the advocacy advocacy group websites. Um, make sure that you are consulting um, websites about you know of an adv advocacy group that is, you know, by people who share a particular identity, um, but always ask. And, you know, if you, you will never be wrong if you use the terminology that the people that you're working with prefer. That's the way to go. 
Okay, so that is person first and identity first language. Next, we're going to talk about asset versus deficit descriptors and othering language. Here we go. So one thing that I think is really interesting um, in the seventh edition, so this is more of a 2020 kind of update, um, is to use asset-based descriptors talking about what people have instead of what they lack. So you know, this is the, the example that always comes up to my mind first. So instead of referring to someone as a high school dropout, you would refer to them as a person who completed 10th grade. So instead of saying, okay, they dropped out of high school, so we're focusing on what they didn't do, we're focusing on what they did do, which is complete the 10th grade. Um, similarly, uh, the term achievement gap has been stricken from APA style um, because the term achievement gap has a, has a lot of baggage associated with it, um, but it's generally thought to kind of for lack of a better word, blame children for uh, situations that they were, you know, born into that are, you know, not their fault. <laughs> they didn't do, you know, they didn't do anything to deserve the circumstances into which they were born. Um, so now the term opportunity gap is used um, just to indicate that, you know, any sort of shortcomings in between groups or things like that are a result of the difference in opportunities that have been afforded to people in that group instead of, you know, their ability to, I don't know, pick themselves up by their bootstraps or whatever, I don't know, however you want to say that. Um, but anyway, this link here, which I will share the slide, the link to the slides after this is over, um, is from Teach for America, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I was trying to find an example of a good way to explain that. <laughs> and, um, I thought they did a really nice job of talking about how um, how we think and talk about the achievement gap, which is not an achievement gap at all. All right, let's see. Othering language. Okay, so othering language um, is basically just language that is used to um, to kind of set a certain group of people apart from the norm or the big group. So um, one example that really stood out to me as an example of othering language is the elderly. Um, and I did see, and, and I've seen this in writing before, but you know, using terms like adults and older adults kind of says that like, so we have adults, like regular adults, but then we also have these other adults. So, you know, using younger adults and older adults so that you don't have what's seen as like the main group and then this other group. Similarly, um, using cisgender as a descriptor for women who, you know, who are who are cisgender, um, instead of saying, you know, women and transgender women sort of implies that, you know, there, there are women, but then there's like this other type of women. So um, using cisgender as a descriptor when you are um, talking about cisgender women, instead of, you know, just having, you know, the assumption that you are, you know, if you say women, that should mean all women, cisgender and transgender women. Also, um, I should say, I didn't put this in my slides, but I do think it's important um, in APA. So they're, they focus a lot on, um, and even in the 70s, this was true, not including information that isn't relevant. So if you are interviewing women and you're talking about all women, you don't have to delineate cisgender and transgender women, because if you just say women, that implies that it's all types of women. Um, similarly, if you are doing a research study on cognitive ability, gender may not matter at all. 
right? That may not be relevant to, you know, if you're not, if you're look, doing research on age. So let's say we're doing something about cognitive decline in age. And I'm sorry, kinesiology people, if I'm messing this up. But basically, if, if your research question indicates that gender is irrelevant, you don't need to talk about gender. So focus on the things that are most relevant to your research. So in this case, if we were researching women and it doesn't, you know, all women are involved in the research, we can just call them women. And that implies that it's all, all types of women. Oh, let me check the chat again, sorry. I think I finally figured this out. Yes, oh, thank you, Rachel. That's an excellent example. I appreciate that. Okay, so this one um, is, this is kind of a different, this is different than talking, we're not really talking about people anymore. Um, but this is something that I have been thinking a lot about personally lately, and um, it's also mentioned in the new Guide to Inclusive Language, and I think it's one of those things to be aware of. And um, one is just, you know, in writing to avoid common phrases. These are incredibly common phrases with ableist connotations. So things that, you know, phrases that imply, you know, like stand up for implies, you know, not everybody can stand. So they can still stand up for something. They can still, you know, be present, lend support, whatever, even if they can't physically stand up. Um, so I have discovered in being more intentional about my language that these phrases like this fall out of my mouth a lot. And so I think it's just a good thing to think about both um, in writing, of course, which is what APA is focused on, um, formal academic writing, but it's also just a good thing to keep in mind um, in, 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 all sorts of in all sorts of ways of communicating. Um, this one, though, is actually even worse for me. Um, I have caught myself saying the phrase killing it about a dozen times this week. And it was since I started making this presentation and I never really thought until I looked closely at the inclusive writing guidelines about that as a violent term. I mean, it is clearly it says killing it, but um, it's interesting to think about that because I had never thought of it before. Um, and of course, another sort of a uh, thing to be aware of in language is culturally appropriate, uh, appropriative language. And I didn't include that in the presentation, but there's a really good list of uh, culturally appropriative language that should be avoided in the APA Guide to Inclusive Language. Um, also, let's see. Oh yeah, well, there's. I'll show you another source in a moment that, also, that talks about uh, culturally appropriative phrases in a workplace, which is very interesting as well. Um, a lot of these phrases, both ableist language, violent language, culturally appropriative language, have made it into, you know, our vernacular and can make people feel uncomfortable, which is not something that I wish to do as a person. So just to kind of summarize what my takeaways are from all of this is that you know we need to always acknowledge humanity um you know make sure one thing that i really appreciated in when i when i first read the new guidelines in the seventh edition of apa was to never talk about cases that cases are actually people <laughs> we're not talking about cases of strep throat we're talking about people with strep throat um and i think that's for me was kind of a, a a game changer as far as thinking about humanity um and making sure that we're always acknowledging and centering people's humanity um also of course respect the terminology that people use to talk about their their identities and also just know that people bring a variety of identities into the world and you know be respectful of how they talk about those um and then also again this one is something that I'm really thinking about a lot these days, to consider the life experience of others and how words that we commonly say may have an impact on them. So um, in addition to the two links at the beginning that I shared, um, these are two other really good resources 
Uh, my amazing colleague, Jenny Dale, shared this first one here, inclusive language from Oxfam. I really like it because it does a really nice job of explaining why. You know, why do we use this kind of terminology? And actually, whoever had the question about males and females or, um, yeah, this link, this inclusive language from Oxfam, I think does a nice job of explaining that better than I could. So I would suggest taking a look at that. I also really liked this, what is inclusive language in the workplace website, because it lists a lot of terminology that I don't think we necessarily think of as culturally appropriate at first. So just a couple of additional resources for you. And that is all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Did it. Oh, Audrey, that is such a good point. Thank you for saying that. We do use, I think that, I think a lot of us speak in a lot of metaphors and you're right that that can be very limiting to people who, who are learning English um, as, as a, an additional language. Yeah, I definitely recommend that link that Amy said about um, examples. Cause like, again, I just think, you know, um, there's so many examples that I just never think of until I see them. Um, so, and so, you know, it's nice to see them for me and then to be like, oh, okay, I will oh, work yeah. on not saying that or think of a different way to say that. Like one that was pointed out to me the other day was, um, you know, saying like, oh, I'm high up on the totem pole, you know? And I was like, yeah. oh yeah, like that is bad. <laughs> like, you know, that but, one's on the list. Um, but like, I would have never, I, you know, it's like, I just don't think I would have thought about that unless someone was talking about it in that context. Um, so someone asked about access to the slides. Um, Amy, if you send me your slides, I will um, send them to everyone who signed up. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. I also put them in the chat, Kenya, but yes, I will send them to you as no, well. They're there in the chat too, if y'all want to just grab yes. them right now, because that's the links to that stuff that Amy mentioned. Yeah, I really um, like the, the Oxfam one. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Amy? Uh, you're welcome to unmute or put them in the chat. She can see the chat now. One of the joys of team is when you're sharing your screen, it's hard to see the chat. If you don't have like <laughs> multiple monitors, um, I use my phone. Is that what you were doing? I used That's phone. what I was doing too. I figured it out about halfway through. I was like, yeah, when I share my <laughs> slide, I've done this enough now. When I share my screen, I just have my phone up looking at the chat, which I mean, I have to always tell people that where I'm like, I'm not texting. Right. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. Um, Telling students that. And and I, I mean the the guide inside the manual and also that link, um, the first link goes into a lot of depth about a lot of different types of cases, you know, how to talk about age, how to talk about gender, how to talk about socioeconomic status. So if you have questions about those sorts of things, I definitely recommend that bias free language um, link. The inclusive language guide is a lot shorter. Um, and uh, it all, I mean, they're both very useful, but, um, so I would definitely recommend taking a look at both of them. Oh, Audrey has her hand up. Yes. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this presentation. Um, just had a follow-up question about um, how do you get individuals to, I guess, buy into um, the use of this language um, without people saying or commenting, oh, you're just trying to be politically correct. In oh, that yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, now that's such, I mean, that's such a good question, Audrey. And it, if I knew the answer to that, I would be working. I'd be the CEO of APA probably. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if they have a. I don't know if they have a CEO. But I mean, I think that's a really good question. I, I think that, and I don't know. I'm not sure that I know the answer. But I think that one thing that might help. I don't know. Maybe not. Is is there if if there's a gentle way to remind people of all the different identities that they bring to the table um, and, you know, thinking about ways that people might talk. I don't know. I don't, I mean, I, that's a good question. So I will say for myself personally, so I have ADHD 
And one of the things that made me really start thinking about this is when people say things like, oh, we all have a little ADHD, you know, and I'm like, no, we don't. Like, no, I actually have this. This is a real thing. And um, so then I really started thinking about, you know, what are the things that I say that uh, that bother, upset, offend other people? And so that's kind of how, I don't know, that, that's kind of how this journey went for me. I also, I mean, Rachel, I think that's a really great point that you made in the chat. The, it is, it's respectful, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's acknowledging that we are all people, that we all bring a variety of identities. Um, and I mean, yes. Can we just make people not be jerks to each other? Um, that would also I think, be great. I think um, just to add my thought on it too, as a librarian who, you know, does a lot with APA, is that I think the nice thing about this being structured within an APA formatting in terms of a class setting is that if students uh, say things like that um, or, or fight against it, you can just say, well, it's a part of the formatting of it's what I'm requiring for this class. You know what I mean? Like you have a um, discipline and a formatting citation structure that is you know, one of the biggest in the world <laughs> backing you up. So I think, I mean, for me in my teaching, when people push back against things like that, I, you know, I would love to fight with them about how, you know, it should just be the <laughs> decent thing to do. But in the sake of time, in the sake of like structure of a um, university, I always appreciate when I have something on my side like that, right? Like yeah. learning objectives, um, formatting within the citation style and formatting, you know, includes writing, um, oral arguments, you know, I mean, so, you know, I mean, it, it's a, way to kind of shut down this idea of, um, you know, oh, I don't want to do this because it's not like what I believe or what, I, you know what I mean? So. Oh, that's a really good answer, Sam. I'm going to um, that Sorry one. that I, but no, I, I just I think about this because I teach so many different classes. And to be clear, yeah. no one has ever um, done that to me. <laughs> I just, right. When I like am <laughs> showing scenarios and talking about formatting and inclusive language um, in terms of a librarian, I, I'm always ready. <laughs> So much work to, I love it. Yeah, okay, well, I've been very fortunate. Um, I don't, I've never had that issue, you know, of a student really fighting me on anything. Um, but I'm sure, I mean, I know that there's a lot of people here who've probably had all different kinds of scenarios. Yes. That, that's extremely helpful. Thank you, both Amy and Sam, and, and yeah. all of those who, who contributed in the chat, too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? I scheduled this. These are 30 minute sessions and I acknowledge people might have to go. Um, I dropped some stuff in the chat, like a assessment form to let us know how we did, as well as the one that's coming up next week. Um, I think Candace, our STEM librarian, is in the space here. Yeah, I think I see Candace in the chat in hey, the hey, people. Candace. Uh, and Candace will be talking about alternatives to Scopus. Um, if you didn't know, we are losing access to Scopus in June 2024. So if you are a fan of Scopus or want to learn more about what Scopus does and since we're losing it, what other things can do that are similar, um, definitely check that session out. Remember that if you sign up for things and can't go, I will send you the recording. You're included in the in the like, hey, here's the webinar email as well as the recording. Um, so just saying no to not attending live doesn't not get you the recording. If that makes sense. So then any other questions for Amy? Um, Ian, in the chat, or you're welcome to unmute. Okay, I feel like I did like almost 10 seconds of silence. Did you count to 10, yeah, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> I counted to 10. Um, so, yeah, and I, I have a... Um, I think I said this at the beginning, um, my my six year old is sick, so um, she has not come in so far. <laughs> I'm impressed. That's it could happen at any moment. Well, part of it, I think you'll appreciate Amy is a mother too, um, that uh, uh, the the remote broke, so she actually can't turn the TV off. Oh, <laughs> and I no. couldn't figure it out before this webinar, so I was just like, your, whatever Netflix feeds you um, from this kid <laughs> channel is what you'll be watching for the next 30-ish minutes. So, sorry, that's for the recording. YouTube, you can uh, hear my hear, hear my parenting tips. Uh, um, yes. So, happy Thursday, First everyone. Thursday. Thank you for coming. Remember that stuff in the chat. Um, the chat lives on. I will also remind you of our session coming up next week. We also have one coming up in 
either March or April on bullet journaling and research. Um, so also interesting, uh, thinking through how to uh, structure your research in, in, an or, in an organized way. So have a great week, everyone. Thank you, Amy. And Thank um, you. we'll see you all soon. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. Bye.